Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. It is three o'clock. We'll get underway, checking everybody's afternoon. Uh, as I look out the window, it is absolutely gorgeous outside, so I won't rub that in. I do want to uh, thank our presenters for making time on a beautiful Wednesday afternoon to join us. I know they have some exciting content to bring you. Um, I've had the, the privilege of reviewing it uh, prior to the webinar, and I can tell you there's some really great stuff we'll be sharing today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, I am Martin Daly, uh, and this is the CDRPC Local Government Workshop webinar, Creative and Resilient Planning During COVID-19. Um, for those of you that don't know us, CDRPC is a regional planning and resource center that serves Albany, Rensselaer, Saratoga, and Schenectady counties. We foster intergovernmental cooperation, communicating, collaborating, and facilitating regional initiatives. We work with partners across the region to help them address regional issues. Um, we established this webinar series to help planners sharpen their skills and as a vehicle for planning board and zoning board of appeals members to obtain their credit hours. Um, planning and zoning board appeals members are required by state statute to abstain, uh, obtain four hours of credits per year, of training per year. Um, and municipalities have a wide latitude in defining what training is acceptable for credit. For those of you that are joining us, after each webinar in the series, each attendee that registered with an email address will receive an email confirming your attendance. And this email can be submitted to your municipality, either to the chair of that governing body um, or to, uh, to a clerk uh, that will um, you can use to submit for your time, for your credit, for your training hours. Um, if for some reason there's a snag with this email, uh, please get in touch with, with CDRPC and we can work to make sure we provide you uh, with a document that is sufficient for your municipality. In addition to those folks that are AICP planners, uh, we have submitted this session for one hour of CM credit for APA credits. So the information is on the APA website. You can log in and get that. Uh, a bit of housekeeping about how today's program, um, I'll be functioning like, um, like a, a radio DJ, if you will, uh, for security purposes. Our, um, our presenters have full presentation capability and screen share capability. You can see them here on the webinar. But those of us, uh, th those folks who are attendees, um, you are muted uh, for your video and audio capabilities. But please use that chat function. For those of you that are new to Zoom, you can see a Q&A or a chat at the bottom of your screen, little icons that look like a cartoon blurb above your head. Please use those to submit your questions or comments as the presentation goes. I will be sure to refer those to our presenters and we'd really like to involve you in the conversation as we move forward. So please use those functions as we go, as we go forward. Um, yes, we do archive the presentations. We'll, put them, we'll archive them as PDFs and put them onto the Eventbrite page that you use to access this webinar. We also are recording the webinar. So the link to uh, that recording, once it is finished being processed and edited, will be available on that Eventbrite page as well. So if you miss something, don't worry about scribbling it down. Um, you can certainly come back and view this and have the opportunity to, uh, to see a, um, uh, a recording uh, of the webinar uh, as it's presented. Today's session will explore creative challenges to ongoing municipal planning operations, existing policies and community engagement and the impact on capital and long range planning projects. Um, and uh, we'll look at some lessons learned from some capital region communities. Uh, and we'll share a variety of perspectives, including those from a municipal planner, a planning consultant, and a volunteer board member. The panelists will also discuss the potential lasting impacts of these changes and others moving forward um, as we plan for more resilient communities. I do want to take a moment uh, and give a special um, shout out or thank you to MJ for underwriting uh, this session. They're always fantastic to be able to rely on them to help us to provide uh, putting these uh, these events together, be it our workshop or our continuing education webinar series. They are a fantastic partner and we, we would not be able to do it without them. So I do want to um, extend a, a special thank you to them. Uh, today we're joined by Jacqueline Hakes, AICP Director of Planning Services for MJ Engineering. John Scavo, Director of Planning for the Town of Clifton Park, and Aaron Maceo, RA, um, RLA. I should have asked you, Aaron, if I'm gonna, if I would butcher your name in advance and I neglected to mention that or ask that question. So hopefully I'm doing okay. And she is a senior landscape architect with CLA site slash Saratoga Springs Complete Streets Advisory Board. So she's she's wearing multiple hats like many planners do. So with that, I wanna open up our session and turn it over to Jack, who will kind of function as the MC for the presenters. But again, if you do have questions, comments, please put them in the chat and I'll make sure to refer those to our presenters uh, periodically. 
with that. Great. Thank you, Martin. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully, everybody can hear me I don't know okay. If I can hear you too well. Um, can any? Can everybody else? Oh, probably just me. You want to? I think that might just be me. <laughs> okay. Hopefully, everybody can hear me okay. Um, thank you, Martin, and thank you, CDRPC, for sponsoring and hosting this session. We really do appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, I would like to briefly uh, welcome everybody and introduce who is going to be participating today. I know Martin did an overview, um, but I'd like to, uh, to talk a little bit more about what each of us are going to be sharing with you today. Um, John, as the Director of Planning for the Town of Clifton Park, will be sharing uh, some of his experiences over the last few months with regard to day-to-day uh, -day operations of, um, of a planning department and a, and a town during these situations, as well as what that impact um, over the last few months might have been on long-range planning initiatives in the community. Erin is going to be wearing her volunteer Complete Streets Advisory Board member hat today and is going to be sharing a little bit about uh, policy changes that have led to, uh, I'm going to say, positive uh, outcomes within the city of Saratoga Springs that have helped to create um, that help to create more and change the public space. Um, and so um, what I'm going to do then is then I'm going to talk a little bit about the, um, the consultant side of things and, and as somebody who's had the opportunity to be able to uh, communicate with a variety of communities and consultants, share a little bit about what we're learning. Okay. Um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Martin. Martin, if you could please um, uh, pull up the first poll. So we'd like to learn a little bit about who is joining us today. Um, if you could please go ahead and select, um, you know, which of these uh, best serve you or best applies to you. Are you public sector, private sector, an elected official, a planning or zoning board member? Um, and if you can go ahead and uh, select the option that best fits you, that would be great. Yeah, I have it as uh, attendees are now viewing questions and we are getting a vote. We just had our first vote come in. And uh, so if folks can respond to the poll. I think that'll be able to inform our presenters as far as who's participating and kind of tailor some of their the, uh, the nuance of their presentation towards you. So I do want to give just a moment to do the polling. We have just a couple of poll questions. Um, they're not they're not SAT questions, so don't <laughs> think much about them. Jackie, I did want to mention while I have while I have the floor, your your mic is coming in kind of fuzzy, so I don't know okay. if you're going your audio or or um, okay. What I will do, yeah, thank you. Um, I'll make an adjustment when I hand it over to John um, with with my mic, so the sound will will be better. Okay. How about that? Okay, great. We always expect the unexpected when it comes to implementing mm -hmm. technology. Yes, um, and if folks could just be patient. Um, all yeah. right, so Martin, let's see who uh, yeah, is joining like us. Most of our people have voted, and I think you can see the response now. I did link close. Let's do share results because that would make it easier for folks to see. Okay. And, uh, so it looks like a, a, a nice cross-section of folks joining us today. 47% uh, are planning board members, 35% from the public sector, and 18% uh, from the private sector, and 6% community volunteers. All right. It looks like it jumped ahead on us as far as what the second poll question was. Let's go right into it. <laughs> So, yeah, one of the things we wanted to understand was um, uh, when this pandemic first hit, did your community or your office, your department, have those accommodations in place to be able to continue your operations um, working virtually or from home? Um, interesting, 47% indicated uh, yes, 29% uh, indicated somewhat, and uh, nearly a quarter indicated no, they did not. So, yeah, Martin, let's move on to the next poll and let's see if folks had a chance to participate in that. So as a follow-up, 
Thank you. As a follow up, uh, we're wondering do you have the systems or technology in place now? And uh, a, a significant 65% indicate yes, and another 35% indicate somewhat. Um, so that's going to be important for us as we kind of work through this with you today. I appreciate everybody taking the opportunity uh, to share with us. Um, and I did want to share a little bit with you. Um, I asked these same questions to uh, a, a group of, of professional planners, public sector planners, uh, elected officials, and volunteer board members um, in preparation for this. And I was curious what the results um, would be from that. Um, that first question, when the impact, when the pandemic first impacted us, um, you know, were you able to accommodate a, a work from home or virtual operation? 56% indicated uh, somewhat. 22 indicated no. When we ask the follow-up question, um, how is that now? What's that situation now? 67% indicated uh, yes, they, they do now, and 33%. Pretty close to those of us, those of you that are joining us uh, today. So um, it's helpful to know that I think we've been adjusting um, and uh, have been flexible over the last uh, few months and working to adjust as best we can um, in, in, in the world today. Asked in preparation for this, um, you know, what has been the biggest barrier to getting those systems in place? Top three time, technical support, and staffing, and funding. I'm sure none of this is a surprise to you. Um, in spite of these barriers, I think um, life has gone on, planning has gone on, communities have continued to do their work, and I think um, the ability to adjust and, um, and be flexible with what it is that, that we have to, uh, to deal with today is something that is inherent in planners, um, and so I'm, I'm happy, happy to be a part of that, that broader planning community. And so it, it, it occurred to me today um, that we might not all be having the same opportunities to communicate with one another as planners. And so understanding from each other what works, what doesn't work, what lessons learned we might be able to imp implement and employ in our communities that we're working in now um, would be valuable. And so that's what we're hoping to share with you today, a little bit about our lessons learned and what we think might stick around and we might be able to continue carrying on. So with that, I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to turn it over to John Scavo, and in the meantime, I'm going to try to get this audio fixed. Thank you, Jackie. John, I saw from your, your presentation, as I was looking through, it would appear you're a Mets fan. <laughs> yes, That's sir. The World Series trophy from 1986. That is. And uh, this is your granted you with, with the, the trophy. <laughs> My beloved Red Sox went home empty-handed. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> is that is that the is that the one is that the one at uh, City Field? That is yes. Uh, we always try to go to at least four or five games a year, my wife and I. And uh, this was the first year, probably in twenty years, uh, we didn't get down there. So. All right, I'm going to be bringing up my screen sharing here, and just want to check Martin. My audio is coming in okay. I hear you wonderful. Okay. Yep. Excellent. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us and taking time out of your day. I always welcome the opportunity to present uh, information that I've gained. Uh, what I continue to learn after uh, doing community planning for 20 years is through dialogue and conversation with colleagues and volunteers on planning boards and zoning boards. I uh, continue to learn and educate myself um, and refine our processes here in Clifton Park to become better in terms of service and how we uh, respond to our community's needs. And one of the things uh, interesting from the poll is I see we did have a lot of planning and zoning board members that are participating this afternoon. So what I did want to do is focus on what can you take away as volunteers on your local planning and zoning board members in terms of a thought processes or way of thinking and as uh, there's a paradigm shift that's clearly occurred over the last uh, year here regarding uh, operations in terms of local government 
and how we conduct business as a result of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, again, John Scabo, Director of Planning. Uh, I've been a planner for about 20 years, uh, of which 16 has been in municipal government, four was uh, within the private sector, uh, doing consulting work for municipal government. And it's something I still enjoy to this day. And I know it's been 20 years, but I feel like I'm just hitting my stride. Uh, so I hopefully I have 20 more years to go. Uh, changes to local government through a sudden paradigm shift or method. Uh, this slide here, I just want to highlight something. One of the things uh, that I had the opportunity to do uh, in the private sector was prepare what's known as emergency operation plans and also at the local level and local government work on uh, emergency operation plans. And what an EOP is looking to do was assign responsibilities to organizations and specific in individuals for carrying out actions um, at specific point in times and places and locations in response to an emergency that exceeds, you know, the routine operations and continuity of government of any one agency or organization. Uh, that's what prior to COVID-19 we would focus on is what is the continuity of government to get messages out to a community? How will we continue operations? What were essential operations? And it set forth lines of authority and organizational relationships and showed how actions would be coordinated so we didn't have duplication of services and emergency responses weren't tripping over uh, one another um, responding to a disaster or crisis scenario. And one of the things I'd like to talk about is describe how people and property will be protected in emergencies and disasters. Uh, when we looked at disasters, you know, one of the things you would do with an EOP is say, what are our most common disasters? And basically the EOPs I reviewed uh, when I was preparing this presentation, including the ones I worked on, and I looked at about 10 of them, you know, talked about snow events in the Northeast, um, when you get into the Adirondack North Country region, rolling blackouts sometimes in the summer months, uh, if there was oppressive heat, uh, where they would actually power down sections of the grid to make sure that the cities such as Albany, Utica, and Syracuse could still run uh, the demand, peak demand for elevator and more dense um, industrial and commercial uses. So you didn't see much in terms of pandemic. When you did, it was in terms of a flu or something that would occur over a two, three week period, if not one or two waves across the season. And it spoke to shutting down um, operations for short, short term periods. And that's what I'd like to highlight on my next slide is right out of one of the EOPs uh, that was at the state level it noted that the first line of defense against pandemics is surveillance, monitoring humans and animal populations to spot outbreaks and contain them quickly. So when you look at globally, we had Ebola outbreaks in Africa. You may have a outbreak in New Mexico uh, related to some tick-borne illness that's transmitted by a rodent. Uh, but it didn't speak to a global pandemic of transmissions that had many forms or ports of entry uh, through uh, just international travel. And again, EOP has identified breakouts uh, within a geographic area and they basically planned for six to 12 week waves up to three waves. And also testing was key because testing talked about containment and support for pop-up areas of outbreaks and never contemplated from what I could find global testing across all geographic regions or areas of the country at any one given time. So I think that's key. And you know, when you look at it, we can look at past crisis but in the responses, but you'll never find two crises where the exact scenario is the same. So that's why I wanna focus on operations and process analysis, because we could drive ourselves crazy planning for the next pandemic and how we think it will spread or break out or the next uh, 
disaster at a national level or crisis, but for all the scenarios we can come up with until it's actually here, I think the best response is look at our processes and how we can adapt our processes to respond to the external factors uh, that are necessitating change on how we do things. And getting to that, um, when I think in those terms, I like to rely on people much smarter than me. Uh, so I would like to just read a quote here from a gentleman, Randy Pendleton, who uh, wrote a book about results rule. And he's an efficiency operations uh, person, motivational speaker, but talks about business efficiencies. And I do view local government as a business. We're serving clientele of the general public and there's certain expectations and outcomes that are expected as a result of the services uh, that are expected to be provided. So uh, getting to his quote, he just noted in organizations purposes and goals set the direction, create, I'm sorry, measures focus the energy on the outcomes, processes create habits and habits drive the culture. You can teach skills and concepts, you can even create momentum and a few smiles through inspiration. But investing in skills and inspiration is a waste of money if there are not processes to reinforce your purposes and principles. The creation and continuous refinement of work processes is a mandatory practice in results, rules, organizations, regardless of the industry. And again, I view government as an industry. And what I highlighted here is what I think is key. At the local level, continuous refinement of work processes is a mandatory practice. So one of the skills that I found of communities at the local level, if you're constantly looking at what technologies are available, how do we operate, what can we do to make ourselves efficient on an annual level and evaluate and refine those po policies, or just note that no revisions are needed for the following uh, reasons, because you're meeting expected goals, you can adapt those principles and policies pretty quickly because uh, you're familiar with looking at them in those exercises. So that's one takeaway that I'd like planning and zoning board members participating today is look at is our purposes and charges don't change. And again, resiliency planning for transition online. Uh, one of the things that occurred in March was executive law 202.1 that has been extended through November 3rd, through Executive 202.67, Executive Order. And this allows for meet, meetings to be held virtually. I'm still doing virtual meetings. I know many planning and zoning boards have got back to in-person meetings with limited capacities. My last uh, planning board meeting, I had 46 participants. So I'm at, you know, the issue of I do get a high participation from the public. So I'm not confident of holding an in-person meeting and ensure that everybody's gonna get into the room. So for me, the opportunity to still conduct virtual meetings have been very helpful. Um, again, that executive order, the governor has been continuing with 30-day extensions in honor about November 3rd. I do expect uh, that to be continued for another 30 days. Um, if people are unfamiliar with the executive orders, if you just Google executive order, uh, 202 or governor's executive orders, you can see the most current. And that's where you can find uh, what rules are in place under the COVID response uh, that we can still operate under. And these are also the executive orders that are provided for the outdoor dining opportunities for the private sector. Also, there's the COVID-19 cluster action initiative. The governor recently implemented a new cl cluster action initiative in hotspots around the state. And I believe there were some zip codes in New York City where there were actually uh, shutdowns and a regression in the opening processes of uh, businesses that were open at least for a short period of time to get specific numbers uh, back in track in referring back to emergency operation plans. That's what they were originally set up to do was those hotspots of containing and isolating and getting numbers to where they need to be. Um, again, we were faced on a state and national level of dealing with that crisis, but I think we're back um, to a census track or zip code um, level, at least in New York State. 
And then I would like to note that there is information on the governor's website regarding the new hotspot restrictions, including maps of new red, orange, and yellow hotspots, and what those hotspots actually mean in terms of the color coordination. Uh, while this is readily available on the state's website, I don't think it's been actively promoted through the media venues, and there may be ways to better educate the public of understanding uh, what certain color designations for their areas or regions throughout New York State mean. So um, again, the guidance is there, but I think the processes, we have to continue to refine on how that message gets out there. Virtual world for remote access. I can tell you 48 hours before my planning board meeting in March, my second planning board meeting, I never heard of Zoom. Uh, and I had to learn pretty quickly as to what it was. And we were able to pull out a transition uh, pretty well. Some of the pros were Chromebooks were already purchased for my planning board members at a cost of about $200 each. Uh, that allowed planning board members to easily transition to a work environment uh, that I at least knew that they had the technologies for cameras, audio, and internet connections uh, through Wi-Fi. It complied with the shutdown of gatherings and the continuity of government, the virtual platforms. Again, I use Zoom, but there were other proprietary technologies such as GoToMeeting. I believe Microsoft has a newer platform that they've also refined. Uh, I can't remember what the name is, but you can look at virtual platforms out there. Uh, some have pros and cons. Uh, I liked uh, the fact that virtual platforms typically are icon driven. So you don't have to have a computer engineering degree to navigate or get to. Um, otherwise, I can tell you, I wouldn't have been able to find my way as a uh, webinar speaker today. Uh, the click of a button, click of a link, uh, something that is easy to understand. And then I did like that most virtual platforms do offer a dial-in option only uh, for people that at least if they can't see what's going on, they can participate uh, through hearing uh, the discussions that are available. Uh, the cons to the virtual platform is assumed internet and technology assets are available to all. And in terms of local governments, I think it's a challenge for uh, the education system in school districts across the state and, and country. Uh, when we speak to environmental justice in any one area, um, there's an assumption that remote technologies, people have an equal platform uh, to access the remote learning capabilities. Uh, nuances of body language and facial expressions are lost. Uh, the biggest feedback I got from um, the applicants was at least planning and zoning board members, if they are participating in a discussion, should at least have their cameras on because the um, speakers and presenters do look for visual cues and head nods um, from voting members of the planning and zoning board members to see are you understanding what I'm saying or do I need to take a step back and provide additional information? There was definitely a loss of those visual cues and uh, with my name ending in an O, I tend to talk with my hands and the facial expressions are key. Our planning board chairman, Rocky Ferraro, uh, same way, you know, we look for those visual facial cues. Uh, so that's something that um, even using a feature like we are here today, the thumbs up or thumbs down, um, just for validation that does everybody understand what we're speaking to or do I need to go back, um, helps you know, provide that feedback. Also the chat feature um, I think is vital for anybody presenting virtually um, or hosting virtually, uh, the importance of having somebody run that chat feature and potentially look for questions in the dialogue that box. We're fortunate here today that as a presenter, Martin is doing that for us, um, but I have had to wear that dual hat at the local level of town staff of running the meeting and also checking the boxes and answering IT questions are for folks. Um, multitasking, technology, interactions, and troubleshooting while presenting, again, speaking to wearing that dual hat at the local level. Uh, getting back to the basics, you know, when we look at planning and zoning boards, when we look at the enabling legislation at the state level, whether you're Clifton Park um, or a city, 
or more rural area um, in the state, we all have the same purpose. The general purpose of the planning board is to provide and guide the ordinarily, uh, the growth patterns, predictable growth patterns and development of the community. And it's accomplished through development of a master plan for the town in which the planning board often advises elected officials of how that plan is coming together in areas that may need refinement in terms of local zoning laws um, and bylaws. And they also look at regulations that govern subdivisional lands, site plans, and special use permits. Same thing with the zoning board. They hear appeals of the chief zoning officers in terms of administrative decisions from he or she. They also provide guidance uh, to landowners and homeowners about uh, the processes and what's needed to appeal and ask for relief from a zoning ordinance in terms of area and use requirements. And some codes uh, designate the zoning board as the body that grants special use permits. Conducting a technology needs assessment uh, to determine what equipment is needed for planning and zoning board of appeals to meet their purposes and regulatory obligations. Again, if you go back to that last slide and look at what do I have to accomplish? Um, I, I looked at, you know, when I went through this process analysis of how am I gonna get to those outcomes of still providing for site plan review, subdivision review and special use permits. Um, at the local level here, I'm not directly involved with the zoning board. Our chief zoning officer handles that. Uh, but I know many communities wear uh, both hats with their staff. Uh, so it would be the same thing for an area variance. I looked at the hardware and software technology of what is the hardware available and then software in terms of apps today. Um, you know, I use Zoom and Dropbox. Dropbox is a shared site that allows me to transmit large files. We were using that in advance of COVID-19 for paper reduction, uh, showing that here's our green initiative to reduce the amount of trees we kill uh, every time we review a subdivision plan in Clifton Park. But I was able to transition my process to meet the current needs to respond to COVID. Access security, username, passwords, and two-step authentication. To date, um, and I'll probably regret saying this, Clifton Park's virtual meetings have not been Zoom bombed. Uh, <laughs> there were examples of communities that were Zoom bombed. Uh, that password, that two-step authentication, uh, having controls with a waiting room, I think were key. And through lesson learned, you saw planning and zoning boards refine their processes. Uh, software and operating systems, security and maintenance. System backups, video, audio, and cloud backups. Basically, under the retention laws in New York State, we're required to keep the videos for at least four months. After a four-month period, you can dispose of that video technology. So knowing what the uh, record retention schedule is through New York State Archives and having an off-site cloud backup system uh, available, I think is key. Creating a system of redundancy, um, either through backup equipment or smartphones. If I had an audio problem here today with my speakers, I could call in and dial in with my smartphone and I can operate my video here off my laptop, but I could be talking to you through my smartphone. So that's the redundancy that we look to have. If any one system fails, how can we still look uh, to operate? Internet and network, Wi-Fi and internet, ethernet connections. And ethernet is a hardwired versus Wi-Fi. Um, I know in the town of Clifton Park at 8 p.m. every evening, our IT is running a backup system. So I make sure that I'm connected to a different network uh, that's not gonna have delays. Also monitoring and operations, indications, meeting length, participation, number of operation, applications filed and process timeframes. I always find that if you're having a meeting and you're transitioning to a different platform, it's good to make sure that if we typically have our meeting in a three to four hour time period, we set realistic goals. And if we find we're going over any, any one project, there's nothing wrong with tabling that project to the next meeting so that you can get to all applicants within an evening. 
uh, especially when you're learning new technologies and um, having the public participate for the first time through the different technologies. Uh, planning provides a vision for the community today and in the future. Uh, this is a par uh, park in Clifton Park. I kind of whitewashed and uh, used some artistic uh, creativity with the image because I just didn't want to highlight or single out any one neighborhood park because this could have been any park in New York City. This is what we saw in the spring and into early summer month with caution tape. Uh, we literally shut down our park playground facilities until we could be comfortable with guidance and social distancing and providing guidance and educating the public of why you don't want large gatherings on any one piece of equipment or having clean down procedures for how will the equipment be wiped down and to what resources can we make available at these parks. Uh, so again, I don't think there was any one plan that ever contemplated these type of actions for outdoor recreational space. But yet when we were uh, shut down, the outdoor recreation is what everybody was clamming for and looking for. And we actually got to see firsthand how underparked um, our recreational assets are in terms of uh, the wants and desires uh, when they're put at the top of the list for what people have uh, to access for recreation when they couldn't go to a cinema uh, for a two hour movie. They want to be outside on a nice day like today. Where do we go from here? Um, again, completely different issue, but there was a book uh, written by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. titled Chaos or Community. And what I plan here to show is within the slide planning shifts or different ways of viewing um, how we view planning today and where we're going. And I, I view it as new dichotomies. Again, this is why I love planning so much. Um, I can't say, yeah, I've been doing this for 20 years and I'm in a routine. This circle and wheel is constantly shifting in terms of I know I, what I need to get done, but my way of thinking through the planning shifts uh, based on today. And I do think that COVID in this global pandemic, just like 9-11, we can fly today. And many of us remember pre-9-11 flight experiences and post 9-11 of what that experience is today and how our processes have changed and been redefined. I think this is gonna be one of those critical decade moments. It's gonna be pre-COVID-19 pandemic, post-20-COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I can tell you drive-throughs. Um, in 2015, when we were doing our form-based code, the question was, do we allow drive-throughs in our town center or not? Ultimately, our, we had a local committee saying, eliminate drive-throughs, we want a walkable downtown. But I had a town board saying, but we're still off a, a, an interstate that connects Montreal basically to New York City. And you can head west from Buffalo to Boston through this corridor. Uh, people want to get off access and get back on the interstate. Uh, so we allow drive throughs, but we have specific design elements that we look for to make sure that they don't conflict with the walkability and goals of our town center. I never realized how important a drive through would be for businesses and fast food operations to even operate uh, for contactless uh, delivery of food. So that is one of the paradigm shifts that I'm speaking to and also contactless payment. Uh, I ordered from a business last night and paid with Apple Pay in my phone and never had to even insert uh, a credit card into a payment system to push the buttons on a keypad or sign. So I think we're going to see the continuation and development of online bill pay and banking opportunities as a result of what uh, we've all gone through. And we're going to see businesses refine their operations um, as a result of how uh, they deliver their products and goods. Parks and trails and recreational assets uh, became, again, desirable uh, communities and for communities in terms of mental health and physical health. Uh, and that was always the case pre-COVID. But I often said a happy uh, workforce that when five o'clock comes can go and enjoy the outdoors uh, during the weekdays, uh, provide for a great work environment uh, for the employers here in our community. It came down to mental and physical health in terms of being in an isolated environment. Uh, we're social creatures. 
We want to participate. We want to have dialogue and discussions. We want to know uh, what other people are thinking and refine our own thought processes based on conversations and dialogue. So how do we get back to that? And then shared parking arrangements. Uh, malls were over parked um, in Clifton Park. Many of our retail spaces in terms of planning for Black Friday right up to uh, January 1st of every year when they're busy. I was able to basically transition that space to allow for outdoor dining opportunities, to allow for uh, curbside pickup of products and goods and repurpose and transition a lot of that space. I think we're gonna see some creative, adaptive redevelopment as businesses redefine their processes on how to accommodate uh, their customers in an outdoor environment. So you may see some of those over parked asphalt areas transition to some new outdoor dining opportunities, maybe um, increase green space in some of those areas and create some outdoor uh, public spaces, if you will, uh, to allow people to enjoy um, the businesses. And then su food supply great chains, grow local, buy local, the importance of restaurants realizing that there was a lot of food waste once restaurants shut down. Um, even if it's only for temporary, farmers had products uh, ready to go to that food supply chain, but they had nobody to get it to um, or a way to transport it. So is there a way for restaurants to work with supermarkets going forward? And we see that today. You can go to a fresh market um, or a market 32 or Hannaford and buy prepared food. Uh, when I was a kid, prepared food was something you open from a box, put in a microwave, and added water. Now you can get uh, grow local products prepared in a way that's a to-go to meal. Um, I think we're going to see businesses transition to more of that as a result of COVID. Uh, redundancy planning, duplication of components in electronics or mechanical equipment in operations can continue to flow or failure to parts. And I speak to rep of information or inclusion of additional information to reduce errors into telecommunications transition and computer processes. What I'm saying here from a simple planner's term is if John Scavo goes down tomorrow for 14 days because of a potential COVID exposure, do I shut down and cancel meetings? Do I potentially stop building permits for the next two weeks? No. As part of my redundancy planning, I have a continuation of operations and continuity of government plan in place that somebody can pick up my files, look at spreadsheets, look at where I am in the process for each individual pro project and pick up where I go. I like to think the town can't function without me, but the reality is they were here before me and they'll continue to be here after I'm gone someday. Uh, and if you think in those terms, you can set processes uh, for somebody can come into my office pick up a project and know what our regulatory obligations are for the project on my desk today. The, the timing of this uh, this request may be kind of strange when you're talking about <laughs> be, you know, going out of commission for a little while, but I do want to make sure that we, we save time for Aaron. And I, you know, so um, <laughs> if you do, <laughs> I do want to be able to uh, provide her with some opportunity and you're presenting such great stuff. I don't want to say, hey, John, we want to put sure. you. <laughs> Not a problem. This um, is my last slide. Thank you, everybody, <laughs> okay. uh, for listening. Uh, the only thing I wanted to highlight here is while we look at a uh, global pandemic in terms of a virus, um, we have 55,000 subs substations in the U.S. You know, we look at power outages in terms of regional or local based on natural catastrophes. What if they all go down tomorrow? How are we ready to handle that? Same thing with global shipping, education, food, inner cities, uh, how do they operate long-term? So that's what this slide was meant in terms of thinking, in terms of processes, uh, not to scare anybody for future uh, next crisis or pandemic, but these are all things to think about as planners that I think over the next decade, we will be looking at and evaluating. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. I really appreciate your insight, especially how things have changed. I'm on my local board of zoning appeals, and, and meetings are meetings are quite different now. Hearing from applicants and members of the public, and it's just um, it's just a different way of doing things. But I like to think we're providing opportunities for more people to be able to participate who um, who couldn't uh, who couldn't participate before. So I, I appreciate um, the insight. Um, you talked a little bit about the ways that communities are reimagining space. 
uh, and they're looking at capitalizing on uh, either access parking or being able to expand opportunities uh, for businesses to be able to bring their operations outside in order to do a little bit of placemaking and also uh, encourage people to, to go to those businesses, but also in a, in a safe way. And I think Erin has some really fantastic information that she's going to provide about what was done in the city of Saratoga Springs and really getting very creative about utilizing some public space in order to make people feel um, more comfortable, but able to provide businesses with the opportunity to continue their operations as interrupted as possible. Hi everyone, thanks Martin. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone today. I hope everybody can hear me okay. Good, you guys? Excellent. Awesome. Um, so I think early in the pandemic, as a as a landscape architect and a, you know a member of the Complete Streets Board, we knew we would have to move quickly to transform our streets to meet the needs of uh, you know a shifting um, society essentially, and understand you know how can we better serve our communities and ensure that our you know, dynamic downtowns are still there um, with all the small businesses um, that that we have. And so we we started out by, um, I just want to make sure, hold on. Okay, here we go, sorry. Um, first thing, it was we worked with the city and, um, you know, the city was really quick um, to make sure that there was legislation to allow businesses to occupy public space. It may seem, you know, that we can just put outdoor dining right out on the sidewalk, but we really needed to think about what are, you know, the state liquor authority, how can people actually dine outside and, and have a glass of wine or a beer? And so, yeah, we created a um, uh, the legislation that allowed for each individual business to um, submit a permit. Um, obviously no fee, we didn't wanna have any hardships with the businesses. And um, this allowed each one to occupy space that was contiguous to their storefront. So this is really important to think about because the um, State Liquor Authority only allows that business to, sorry, we've got a lot of truck traffic behind me. Um, to actually um, have a dining establishment adjacent to that storefront. So um, I'm going to start with Henry Street. I, I, you know, I hope some folks um, on the call today and um, on the webinar have um, visited Henry Street before. Um, this was a location that we work with um, the business association. So we had four businesses there that wanted to participate and occupy a parking lane. Um, and I show this graphic because the components with all of this, um, when you're creating parklets that we call non-platform, Form parklets. You might have seen some um, examples of parklets from around the country where there's, you know, a wooden platform, but we didn't have time for that. We needed to move quickly to ensure that our businesses could open and essentially that, that they could um, bring people off unemployment and to actually get them working again. Um, so the components are simple, planters, um, bollards, and um, traffic safety features, and I'll go into more of that. So um, implementation, these are quick implementation measures that can transform spaces. And this was, a, we worked with a local um, construction company and a, a concrete prefabricator. They actually donated the blocks and we installed this starting at 4.30 in the morning and we were out of there by 10. And so it was a very quick way to get the blocks in place and make sure that there's no disruption to traffic or to the businesses. So this is kind of some of that um, separation that I was talking about, and, I, and there's a couple different things. One, we saw that the businesses wanted to start to shield and protect their um, diners from the street, and um, you know, concrete blocks help that. That's a very good traffic feature, um, but also in between restaurants, so that legally they could um, actually serve client uh, customers on the street. Um, but what we started to see, admit, you know, a very difficult um, year for everyone. Uh, we started to see the life of our cities come back. I don't know about you guys, but I've had, I had the experience early on walking around Saratoga and just feeling like, oh my gosh, where is everyone? And just, you know, feeling that, oh, what if, what if something happened to this place that we all love? And then we started to see people be able to dine, you know, and just walk streets safely um, and, and bring back that vibrancy. 
One thing that we um, also were really, you know, wanted to ensure with that is that these spaces could be used um, at, you know, any time of day in the evenings and actually get people back out into um, into the downtown fabric and um, bring back some of that vitality. But and you'll also see in these photos is heaters. We live in a place that has four seasons and we need to think about the fact that um, it gets cold and how can we extend that season um, of outdoor dining. And so we are, um, we've extended it even further um, and people are still enjoying these spaces. One thing that we love to test and we're hoping to do is to keep at least Henry Street or Phyla Street some of these through the winter. So we can see how businesses actually use these spaces um, for programming throughout the throughout the winter seasons. Erin, that space looks really inviting. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. It's, um, um, we, had a, we, had, we did have a question. Um, were oh, there sure. any requests for outdoor spaces from businesses and how was that handled? Um, can you say that one more time? I'm sorry. Uh, were there any competing requests for outdoor space? Oh. Was there any necessity for the city to kind of manage if a, if a restaurant wanted a particular space that was in the public right away and there was another interest at play in it? Um, so we didn't, so both Henry Street and Phyla have really, um, Phyla Street doesn't have a business association, um, but they were able to work out the space in a way that each restaurant had um, the space allotted. One thing on Phyla Street was that we have, um, we have a lot of different types of, of businesses. We have Cafe Lena, which is a music venue, and we have, you know, Cole's Wood, uh, Woodwinds is a music shop, um, and we have different types of restaurants, pottery shops and things like that. Um, we needed to ensure that there wasn't a competition and that we weren't um, actually uh, deterring anybody getting into the, the retail businesses. And I think this is really important because most legislation that came out to use public space was only for outdoor dining and it wasn't for retail. And so that's something as a complete streets committee, we are constantly you know, reaching out to businesses and trying to understand you know, how best can we accommodate that retail component. John mentioned you know, pickups. Um, that's something maybe we could facilitate um, through expanded outdoor space. And so those are kind of some of the future things that we're thinking about now. Um, but I don't know of any specific com competing uses other than just access. And this was really important here um, that we provided ADA access, that we maintained commercial um, loading and also tour bus accommodations. Um, you know, Cafe Lina is still having some venues just live stream, but that um, the musicians can get there and that people can get to um, the retail establishments. One thing with Phyla Street, and you know, I was um, when we were putting this together, I was really excited to think of parklets on both sides of the street. You know, we really have come a long way from um, you know a couple of years ago or even last year um, to thinking of how to transform um, our streets. And one thing that was really crucial here was ensuring that the travel lane, main, you know, was maintained. That we did not have any impact on it. We actually expanded it a bit um, it's to ensure that we would. Um, accommodate fire trucks that we allowed um, uh, fire hydrants to be open, you know, so all of those emergency access components were maintained with the street. Um, but what we saw was that, you know, sometimes a narrower street isn't the worst thing because you actually provide more space for people to, um, you know, make it more of a human um, focused environment versus a car fo focused environment. And so um, this really started to change with six um, businesses be being able to use these spaces. Um, one thing, this is in front of Hattie's um, and the, the city and to complete streets board, we wanted to ensure that ADA access and um, space through the parklets was maintained. This is still public space and we wanted to ensure that people, we were not in, inhibiting anyone walking through there. Um, some of the businesses have actually, you know, will ask hostesses, will ask, please, you know, put your mask on. We have diners that are eating, you know, unmasked and this is kind of a mask zone. Um, this is, you know, and, you know, don't be afraid to bring the parking right up to the barrier. Um, you know, parking spaces, we, we were able to accommodate quite a, quite a bit of parking with um, the new parklets. So where are we going from here? And I'll, I'll try to be quick because I know we don't have a ton of time. Um, and so, you know, we can go through this another time maybe. But um, one thing is, how can we look to our streets 
look at traffic safety and ways that we can use expanded public space to ensure that we reduce crossing distance, that we you know slow vehicles down and make our communities really um, incredible, you know, as walkable as they can be. That's always my focus. Um, and so these spaces can transform over time from concrete blocks to um, more plaza um, type spaces. And these are examples from around the state. And I'll just go through these quick. As I mentioned, accessibility is really important. So any community that's looking to change the curb line, you are changing where someone that's visually impaired can access, you know, can understand where that curb line is. So it's really important, even with these temporary spaces, um, to include access to bus and, um, and crosswalk and um, detectable warnings. Um, ultimately, these spaces bring out what is so amazing about um, all of our places and all of our communities. And I think, you know, uh, more space is, the, is better um, for, for many things. Implementation needs to be quick. And um, I'll just go through this very quickly. We don't have a lot of money in a lot of our communities right now. We have, a, you know, some issues with the fact that we don't have as much tax base um, from this last year. And so we need to think creatively on how to implement things quick using volunteers, using simple methods to expand public space and keep people safe. Um, and so I'll end it there um, and I'll, I'll let, um, we can answer questions and uh, we can transition to Jackie, but thank you so much, um, everyone. Thank you, Erin. Uh, we had we had one question related to parking. Um, when we're talking about reactivating some of the space uh, on the street, the public space on the street, specifically for people, uh, mm -hmm. what has been the response from uh, the business community or um, the the I'll say the customer community um, about the the um, the loss of those parking spaces? Um, I think. It was, we haven't heard one thing about limited parking. Um, and that was a surprise to us. We were concerned about that, especially on Henry Street, losing um, parking without um, a balance of the parking. Um, I'll just mention one thing and it's that, um, Parking never became an issue with spaces like these um, because people found their way there. Um, Henry Street and Flatbread Social were able to have 100% capacity even without track season, without all of those tourist, um, you know, events throughout the season. And that's pretty incredible that, uh, you know, removing one parking space or, you know, here it was five, um, could provide that support for uh, small businesses. Yeah, also uh, some local experience anecdotally from Albany, um, when the city of Albany was doing, uh, implementing uh, a, a reconstruction of Madison Avenue and installing bike lanes, there was a, there was quite a bit of healthy public debate about the role of parking and providing uh, uh, opportunities for those businesses. And when, um, when the city started shifting into response, very similar to uh, Saratoga Springs and reactivating some of those parking spaces, some of the same business owners that were very, um, perturbed about the loss of a potential space near their business were um, quite vocal about uh, their support of eliminating parking spaces so they could put tables on the street um, because there were less and less people were coming into uh, to, uh, to the business to eat. They saw it as an opportunity to activate space for themselves. So I, I think that shows a little bit of a dynamic shift in um, mm -hmm. business communities recognizing the benefits of providing space for people rather than vehicles. Um, we don't have any more questions, but I do want to see if the panelists would be would be willing to look into their respective crystal balls, so to speak, and see how many of these changes, uh, both on the the um, the street design scale or some of the operations scale that John had talked about, do you see uh, becoming more of a permanent change as opposed to a response to to the pandemic? One of the things, Martin, that I you know remember twenty years ago. It used to be you record your meetings and you'd have a local public access channel to upload the video and then people could watch either town board planning and zoning board meetings. Uh, that's kind of become obsolete, but with the ability of at least web platforms to broadcast live, I do think that you get a higher participation and it's one of the things I didn't expect. I'm getting more participation from the general public uh, who typically only showed up if the public was near them, I'm actually getting people interested in planning and zoning because they don't have to leave their house and can just tune in and do other things while they listen. So I do think we may see a hybrid going forward at some point uh, for outreach and participation. Yeah, planning and zoning makes for great reality TV. I don't know why people are 
you know, people have chosen to tune out. Aaron, what about you? Do you see any, do you see any permanency to the changes that are being implemented? Uh, for example, on Phyla Street or Henry Street? Um, I do. I, I think the businesses and, and the community is look, is, wants to see it next year, and we have heard that. Um, as a volunteer on the uh, Complete Streets Board, we're looking for ways that we can make this um, something that more businesses can participate in and help them with design standards so that they can easily implement um, these spaces. But I think, um, yes, I definitely see this um, going, to, going into the future. And Jackie, you have experience beyond, I mean, John, John is talking a lot about the way that uh, Clifton Park has implemented changes and Aaron's talking about things that are happening in, in, um, in the downtown Saratoga. From your experience and working with clients across the region, um, have you seen similar circumstances, of the, the change in doing business, both from an administrative point of view and, and uh, out on the street? Uh, yes, Martin, and hopefully everybody can hear me now. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yep. Great, thank you. Talk about redundancy, John. Uh, thank goodness for phones when the uh, AirPods don't work. Um, but yeah, to answer your, your question, Martin, uh, we have seen um, uh, communities uh, adapt in a variety of different ways. And, and I do think that those adaptations are likely something that will just be integrated into the, the practice moving forward, whether it's a land use board practice or it's a community engagement practice. I know we've, um, we've been able to uh, shift and, and adapt from the, the private sector to meet the needs of, of our private sector clients that are um, still trying to move forward with long range planning, um, the heart of which is public engagement, right? So how do you do that in today's world? Um, certainly uh, different uh, types of virtual uh, public uh, forums um, John, to your point, um, we've been utilizing ArcGIS story maps to, uh, to share information. And in one community over a two week period, we had 550 views and over um, 120 comments. Uh, that's pretty substantial, you know, when you're talking about a planning, you know, downtown planning project. Um, and I do think a lot of that is that it's more convenient for people to participate when it fits their schedule. Um, you know, we've also been able to uh, take uh, an, an obsolete bridge van um, and turn it into mobile engagement. So we go into parking lots, into a community, um, socially distanced, masked, communicate with the public what to expect when they get there um, so that we can still have some face-to-face, -face, but it, um, it, it is challenging. But I do think a hybrid of, of a lot of these techniques and approaches that we have um, out of necessity, had to embrace over the last few few months, will continue. Um, I think we're fine tuning them, and um, you know, finding better ways to to communicate and and get input and feedback from the public. Yeah, I think that's true. There's definitely a hybrid approach that'll probably be implemented as we move forward. Recognizing there is a there is a digital divide in many communities as far as who has access to public meetings now that we've now that we've provided them online and being able to recognize the public needs to interact with these with these processes and decisions in multiple different ways. I think communities are going to continue to struggle with that, but they're also going to find innovative ways to meet the public. So, but I want to thank you very much. I want to thank MJ for underwriting this, this session, being able to bring it to folks. Uh, we talk about ways that we are uh, bringing uh, new features of planning out to the public. We are archiving this presentation as a video. That link will be posted to the Eventbrite page. We also uh, will have PDFs of the presentations available should you need those. Those will uh, also be archived to the Eventbrite page. For those of you that are looking for your credit hours for planning and zoning boards, you will get an email immediately after the presentation that's um, tied to your attendance. So it will reflect your attendance in this. You can submit that to your municipality. For AICP, we have submitted this for one hour of AICP continuing education credits. Um, so simply go on the APA website uh, and look for the name of this webinar, or, or if you need to, just contact CDRPC and we can try to connect you if you're having trouble with either of those. But again, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to our presenters for taking time this afternoon to share their expertise uh, with all of us, and uh, wish everybody a happy and healthy Wednesday afternoon. Take thank care. You. Thank you.